So it has been a while, right? It has been about four weeks since I made the last YouTube video. And today I wanted to give a short explanation and then also give you a new video. So the last thing you might have seen by me is two live streams where I work on the cal.com website. And actually that website is already live by the way, but the project also was quite a little bit stressful. The deadline was pretty tight and it took me a lot more time than I had hoped. Next to that, I was also supposed to go on holiday for one week. I haven't been on a holiday for a year right now, just working on getting this content out for you guys. And then because of some unexpected illness in the family, that got cancelled too. And then to get rid of all the stress in my body, I decided to migrate all of my website that was still in XJS to Astro. I mean, I'm super happy with that result, but that's definitely a topic for a different video. But those past few weeks have definitely been a little bit stressful and took some toll on me, so I had to take it down just a little bit. But I'm back working and I'm also making content for you. However, in order to still get some content out this week, I actually decided to share a lesson with you from my Frame of Motion course. In that lesson, we're gonna dive into ways that you can make responsive designs without writing a single media query. And not because I'm against media queries. But I think if there's a smarter way to do things for which you write less code, then why not try to go with it? So let's not wait any longer and dive into that video. And then I can get to start working on next week's video. Oh, and one final note, definitely don't click away with the very first thing I'm explaining because I'll be showing you max width and min width, which feels like really standard and default and boring and something everyone knows about. But I've seen a lot of cases where people didn't use it. And after that, we'll be taking it a step up with every topic that I introduce. So let's sit back and enjoy this video. Writing media queries for our styles is something that we got really used to. Making breakpoints in our styles to set a different width or font size or something like that is something that to many of us has become second nature. But you know, nowadays there's quite a few ways for you to write responsive styles without writing a single media query. Because in the end, if you don't need to write them, well, that means less code, maybe even less complexity, less maintenance, and that's always a good thing, right? Let's just dive in and check out these different techniques and see what they can do for you. So for this, I made a very basic example playground that is actually not inside the article. In the article, you find direct the examples themselves and not this live playground. But what we're gonna do is we are just gonna use this playground as like an empty project and play around with all the different options. So one of the things we're pretty often making responsive is of course the width of an element. If we would, for example, go in here and we remove this and we're gonna make like a diff and then we're gonna add a class name on there, container for example, and then we're gonna hop into the CSS because why not do it with CSS this time? We're gonna write container and then we can say background color hot pink, nice. Give us a padding of 12 pixels and make it, ooh, you see I write tailwind too often, now I'm gonna start writing around it. Of course, border radius, 12 pixels. Okay, well, that just gives us something. And now let's say that we want to make this element have a width of, for example, 600 pixels. So that way, if we would scale this up, you will see that it has like this fixed width and that of course it doesn't go bigger, but as soon as you go smaller, we get a scroll bar because it doesn't fit anymore. So for that, we're also gonna create a media query at media screen, only screen at max width, let's say 520 pixels, no 640 pixels. And then we're gonna say container width 100%. Oh, and we need to write pixels, of course. 640 pixels and then of course you see that we all of a sudden have this element that I guess is responsive now, right? So this is something you see quite often. However, trust me, this is still a basic example, but I think something that's also skipped way too often. I don't like writing it like this because what you also could say is you could say width 100% and then we're gonna say max width 600 pixels. And then all of a sudden we can remove the media query and we have the exact same behavior, but now we don't need the media query at all. And of course, you can do this also with max width, max height, maybe even min width, min height. And in my opinion, these things aren't used enough, but they are, like you can see, super valuable and prevent you from having to write any media queries at all. I think exactly because it is so simple, it is something that's often overlooked. So definitely, if you start writing media queries for width and height, absolutely try to think next time if you're able to combine max width, min width, and width to create something similar and something that will work for all the different breakpoints. 
And besides that, maybe you don't even need to specify anything at all because like the web is responsive by default. It only started when we started to invent media queries and we thought we had to make different breakpoints for all of these different devices. But out of the box, if you would simply remove the width and max width, you will see that we kind of have the exact same behavior, albeit that it goes beyond the 600 pixels, of course. But apart from that, the web is responsive by default. That is just the way it was created. This is still a quite easy example. Let's go towards a more complicated example where we have multiple elements in the same parent. So let's just remove, let's do some cleanup. And we're gonna go back to our app. And let's say we're gonna add a div with class name child. And we're just gonna add multiple in there. Then we're gonna go into our styles the child will have background color light blue. Then we're going to give this a padding of 24 pixels and also border radius 12 pixels. So by default, if we specify nothing, of course you see that everything is 100% width, but also like it's kind of again is responsive, right? Everything scales with it. But I get it, that's not what you want. So now let's say that we have these blocks and we want them to be at least, for example, 100 pixels in width. And as soon as we have reached the maximum that fit on a single row, it will just flow to the next row. So there's multiple things we can use for it. One of these things is CSS grid. We could say display grid. We would do that. Nothing at first will change because we also need to specify what type of columns that we're actually going to have. So we could say grid template columns is 1fr, 1fr. That just tells the browser that we should create a grid that has two columns, and both of these two columns are exactly the same width. And if it doesn't fit anymore, it will flow to the next line. So we can also add a CSS gap, or for example, eight pixels. Then we also see the elements a little bit better. However, one of the cool properties that we can add to CSS grid is called min max. So we could add or it's not specifically CSS grid, it's actually just a CSS math function. So we can add min max, and then we can, for example, say 100 pixels and then 100 fr. And actually, let's just change this to 300, and we're gonna only add one column for now. But what you see is if we go smaller than 300 pixels, it will overflow its parent. And that is because we have reached the minimum of 300 pixels. So this element will never become smaller than 300 pixels. So now the thing is, if we would combine that with the CSS grid function repeat, and as the first argument, we add auto fit, then we are actually repeating this for as many times as will fit inside of the parent container. So if we now go bigger, you see that all of a sudden we go to a two column layout. But as soon as the elements start shrinking, you see that it shrinks a little bit, but then it goes smaller than 300 pixels, and then it will go to the next line. So if we now go back and change this to 100 pixels again, you see that all of a sudden we have like five elements, and if we go bigger, you see that we get even more. And if we go smaller, you see that there's less and less and less, and that sometimes the elements is a little bit bigger, but it will never go smaller than 100 pixels. So now all of a sudden we create it like this responsive grid, but we didn't write a single media query. And this again is a super powerful CSS grid feature. However, depending on if you're used to working with CSS grid, this could also be a little bit complicated. And especially if you have easy grids like this that simply flow to the next row, you could also use display flex. So let's say display flex, and then actually we're gonna add a width of 100 pixels to our children. Then at first that doesn't do anything. And that is because of the nature how CSS Flexbox works. Or at least you see that there's some growing and shrinking and shrinking very small and then go beyond its parent. However, what you can add if you're using Flexbox is flex wrap wrap. And that again will do the exact same thing. If the element would shrink smaller than the 100 pixels, it will move it to the next line. So again, we get the exact same behavior. It tries to fit as many on there as possible. And of course, we can also add that gap back of eight pixels, and we pretty much have the exact same behavior. And we could even say that if there is room for elements to grow, just like we would have in CSS grid, we can do the same thing in Flexbox as well. So what we could do then is instead of adding it on a container, which would be the way to do it in CSS grid, in a children, we're actually going to add flex grow one. 
and that all of a sudden will allow the child to grow beyond the set width. And as you can see on the right, the smaller or the elements that have only three on the row are able to grow bigger than the elements with four. And if we scale it even up, you see that we get an even larger elements or smaller if they go next to each other in a single row. And now again, we have this like responsive behavior without adding a single media query. And again, you can definitely combine that by adding a max width of 500 pixels, for example, on the container. And then you also have still the responsive behavior, but your element will, of course, also have a max width. And I think these CSS features are quite powerful. Both with CSS Grid as well as with Flexbox, you're able to make these responsive animations without writing a single media query. But I don't think it stops here. There's also some very interesting units that have been recently introduced that could also help you a lot. The first CSS unit that I actually want to look at is the unit CH. And the CH unit stands for character. So if we would, for example, give this a max width of 50 CH, we're telling the browser to give this a max width of the width of 50 characters. So if that would be text in here, there would be fitting 50 characters or actually 50 character zeros because the zero, like this zero, that's actually what the CH unit is based on. So there would be 50 zeros that will fit on the line and that is the max width of this element. So that means that if we would add a font size of 20 pixels, for example, you saw that the element grew. But if we have a font size of 12, you see that the element becomes smaller. Again, because in this case, I'm not going to count, but the browser says that there is 50 numbers zero that will fit in a single line. So this way you can make your component adjust to the font size that you have set on it. And again, are adding some responsive behavior without needing to do anything. If you change the font size based on the media query, the CH value will also update and it will automatically make sure that it fits again. The other unit that is actually pretty exciting to use and is still quite new are the container query units. I made a full video about container queries as well, but what it pretty much does is you're able to adjust something based on the width of a container, so the width of an element. So let's say this diff is 500 pixels in width. You can write like a media query saying if this element is larger than 500 pixels in width, do X, otherwise we do Y. So instead of reacting to the screen's width, you're actually reacting to the width of an element. And now as a result of that, you can use container query units. And container query units are also really helpful. Let me show you what they look like. The first thing you need to do for a container is define a name of your container. You do that by adding container name, and then we're gonna say wrapper, for example. And now we have created a new container. So this pink element is now a new container and has the name wrapper. In our case, we don't do anything with that wrapper name, but it is a requirement to define a new wrapper element or a new container element, I mean. The fact that this is called container as well as this is by the way unrelated, that's just a coincidence in this case. But because we have now defined the container, what we can do is in our child element, we can say 20CQW. And if we now for a second remove the flex grow, we see that still this element has specific width. And that width is actually 20% of the total width of this element. So it's including padding and the gaps and everything. This block is now 20% of the size of its parent. And the cool thing about this is that you could probably get here with percentages as well if you're using a direct child. However, you can use the container query units also deeply nested inside of its other childs. So let's say we have our, for example, the second child. And then we're going to add a diff in there again, a nested child. And then we can go into our styles and go to nested child. And then we can, for example, say background green, adding five pixels so we at least can see something. And then we can say width, let's make it 40 CQW, so container query width. And then you see that this child element is still reacting to the width of the hot pink element. Although I forgot one thing, and that is that we also need to set what type this container is. And by specifying container type inline size, we're actually saying that this container lies on the inline axis, which is the horizontal axis. Because now you see that the 20 CQW is actually about 20%, and the same thing goes for our green diff, which is now about 40% of its parent. So I forgot about this earlier, but this line is actually pretty important to add. 
But then you all of a sudden see that we can respond and say that this element is 40% of a grandparent and not this direct parent. So if you would use percentages, of course, that wouldn't work. And I will also normally take into account the padding of this element too. So the 100% is the room inside of the padding. So now by using container queries, we can all of a sudden respond to an element that is a parent of a parent of a parent and change our look based on that. And next to having the width of your container query unit, there's multiple units that you can use. You have the block size as well as the inline size, which are actually called logical properties in CSS. And for that, I also have a video up on my YouTube. They're actually a better alternative for width and height, but you can pretty much combine it with what you're used to for width and height. This is like the improved version of that. But next to that, you also have the container width, of course, and the container height. So you can also use those units. And there is also CQ max and CQ min, which are the min and max value of either the width and the height. So these units, they, you can all use them and, and style your element based on something relative to the parent. And again, that is something that's really helpful because you can now respond to the width of your element. And if you set some max width because of Flexbox or CSS grid to that element, your child suddenly responds to that and you don't need to write a media query. And again, super helpful. And as the final part of this lesson, I still want to talk you through some CSS mod functions that I think are really useful as well to create responsive animations without that media query. So the very first CSS mod function that you've probably used before is called calc. And a calc is pretty much what the name implies. You can do a calculation inside of it. So you could, for example, say, we want 50 CH, but we also want to add 20 pixels to it. So that way, you add 20 pixels to that CH value, and the browser will do the calculation for you to convert those two values into a value that makes sense if you add it together. You could even say it is 10 CH plus 10 viewport width. I don't know why you would do that, but you could do that. And you could go completely mad here in calculating some things. And because you have access to these, for example, viewport units, CH units, the container query unit, all these things, you can make like a calc that makes a lot of sense in your use case and again, saves you from that media query. Next up is a clamp. And clamp is actually a function that's also used in animations a lot. What you can do with clamp is you can tell the browser that you want to clamp a certain number between two specific values. So you can, for example, say, I would like this element to be at minimum 50% of width, but preferably, if ever possible, I would like it to be 480 pixels. But as a max value, I want this to be 80% of the width of the page in any case. To repeat what I just said, so this clamp function now says, I want this element to be 50% of the page at the minimum, but maximum 80% of the page, and try to get it to 480 pixels. And then you see that if you start going up and down, that you again have some responsive behavior, but that you also have more control over the width of this specific element. And with the clamp function, you can do pretty cool things. But in case the clamp function is not for you, you can also use the CSS min function. You can say min 50% and 480 pixels. So what this then does is it will only pick the smallest value of the two. So the element is always 50%, but if 480 pixels is smaller than 50%, it will be dead. So you see that if we keep on going, that all of a sudden it will stop. And actually my window doesn't go larger than that. So let's say 200 pixels it won't grow towards 50% anymore. But as soon as we go smaller, you see that it also goes smaller again. And the same thing you could do for max. If we use max, you see that it immediately jumps to 50% because it picks the larger of the two. And if we go small enough, you see that we get to the 200 pixels because 50% is now smaller than 200 pixels. And again, you're using some nice CSS functions to add responsive behavior. And I think these things are actually really nice features of CSS, and people just don't use them enough. More than often, we just write another media query and call it a day. But actually, this could be really helpful. And especially if you want to write a responsive animation, if you don't have to, your code will become easier. So in that case, it might be even more worth the effort to think about adding it. But as a final thing, I want to say that there's nothing wrong with media queries at all. I just wanted to show you that there is also alternatives and also that you might write media queries just a little too quick. But again, nothing wrong with media queries and just use them as you see fit. And of course, I had to hop in 
at the very end of this video to say thank you very much for watching this video. If you're interested in the way that I teach in these lessons, definitely check out my course linked below as well, because there we'll be diving into a lot of frame of motion topics, but also in the future there will be way more courses that are all included in the Frontend FYI Pro Plan. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in next week's video.